Uh, we are going to get started. I would like to welcome all of you to the fifth annual Bridgework Conference. Uh, I am Thais Carter and I direct the Institute for Leadership and Service here at Valparaiso University and we are the host of today's event. So on behalf of myself, uh, my colleague Katie Carstensen and the alumni chair for Bridgework, Caleb Rollins, I would like to thank each of you for making the time to be here today for what we see is a critically important conversation. Uh, so I like to say that one of the best things about having a really grandiose <laughs> title like the Institute for Leadership and Service is that a lot of interesting things fall under this umbrella of leadership and service. So we can show up for conversations about women's empowerment. We can show up for conversations about innovation in business. We can show up for conversations about the state of race relations in this country and what that means for us who want to lead and serve in our communities. And we can host conversations about the impact of opioids on the communities that we are a part of. We get to say yes to so many interesting topics because here at Valparaiso University, we understand that student formation is about more than just giving people professional skills to go and do the work that they do when they leave, but also forming them to be good people. People who care deeply about their families, their neighborhoods, their cities, uh, and their neighbors. And so for me, I think that when we talk about vocation, which is a really big word that can be a little bit scary, uh, I like best to describe it as what it means to both make a living, make a life, and make a difference. Uh, and so as much as today's theme fits into those three things, it is just an honor to be able to have you all here today. Uh, so since its inception, Bridgework has been a space for bridging theory and practice and finding the intersection between big questions and bold action. The last couple of years, we've been focused on topics that lend themselves to interdisciplinary discussion, in large part because we think that we live in an interdisciplinary world where no one discipline gets to make all the decisions about how we approach solutions. It requires multiple perspectives and multiple gifts to make progress on the biggest issues of our day. And so I think that for our theme this year, Opioids in Society, we believe that that is even more true. According to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the Midwestern region alone saw opioid overdoses increase 70% from July 2016 through September 2017. On this campus and in our broader community, it seems as though everyone knows someone who has struggled with opioid addiction, either parents or siblings or friends. And we wanted to provide a space where people from a variety of backgrounds could listen and learn from people who have both lived through that story and also people who are working on both prevention and the support of those who are in recovery. This is a space where both the neighbor and the nurse, the son and the social worker can all come away with information that in some small way prepares them to be part of advocacy and allyship in their communities. As I wrote in my welcome letter in your program, the goal of today's event is not to solve the opioid crisis. Rather, we hope that you experience today's program as a call to education, a call to action, and a call to community. And so it is on that note that I am honored to introduce Dr. Travis Ryder, our keynote speaker. Dr. Ryder is the Assistant Director for Education Initiatives, Director of the Master of Bioethics degree program, and a research scholar at the Johns Hopkins Berman Institute of Bioethics. He's also a faculty affiliate in the Center for Public Health Advocacy. Although he has written on a variety of topics, most of his current research involves the ethical and policy issues surrounding prescription and illicit opioid use. On this topic, he's published both in the academic literature and the popular press, in addition to speaking regularly to clinicians, academics, and the public. His TEDx talk, The Agony of Opioid Withdrawal and What Doctors Should Tell Patients, has been viewed by millions. And Dr. Ryder's newest book, In Pain, A Bioethicist's Personal Struggle with Opioids, uses his own story of opioid dependence and withdrawal as a vehicle for exploring the tragically difficult challenges that America faces in the midst of an unprecedented drug overdose epidemic. So as someone who has both important scholarship and an important story to share, I can think of no better person to kick off Bridgework 2019. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Travis Ryder. Thanks so much, Tice, and uh, thanks everyone for showing up bright and early on a, on a Saturday. This is Saturday, right? You're on the weekend, okay. Um, I'm, I'm really inspired by this conference. I just want to say that up front when Tace first uh, called me and, and invited me to come speak today. 
Um, I had to figure out what bridge work was and, and what the goal was. Um, and as a philosopher by training, I did my PhD in philosophy at Georgetown University, uh, someone who now tries to work with clinicians, work with public health scientists, work with advocates, and try to make on the ground progress regarding the opioid epidemic. Um, this idea of bridging theory and practice uh, rings pretty true to what, basically what I do with my life these days. So I'm really grateful to be here. I'm thankful that you all are here. Uh, I got a story to tell you, so I'm going to do that now, if that's okay. Um, beginning of 2015, I was a, I don't know, pretty standard philosopher ethicist. Probably none of you know what that means, but for me it was like a well-established identity. Um, I was working on things that would definitely have not gotten me invited to speak here today. I was working on climate change ethics and sustainability, a little bit of food. Um, what made a difference, what kind of set my life on its current path is that a couple months into that year, a few months into that year, May 23rd of 2015, I was hit by a van on my motorcycle, which, yes, I was an idiot. Sorry about this, get that out of the way. Now, I was riding a motorcycle. My mom's in the room, I have to say this. Um, hi, mom. Uh, so, May 23rd, I go out for a, a motorcycle ride, um, celebrate Memorial Day weekend. I made it about three blocks from my house, and a distracted driver blew a stop sign and T-boned me. And the result was this. So you can barely see it, that's too bad. I'll get the gory x-ray, okay. Um, I don't put the flesh wound picture up there because that would just be disturbing for everybody, but I do put the x-ray up there just to show you um, what happened, which was that my left foot was crushed between the van and the motorcycle. And if you can see that, but you're not a, a board certified radiologist, it's just that's not what a foot's supposed to look like. Um, so basically what happened was uh, several of the bones, the, the first metatarsal, the big bone, and uh, the big toe bone, and the second and third metatarsal um, shattered and, and blew a hole out the inside of my foot. The result of this is what, uh, it put me into what docs call a limb salvage situation. So I was under threat of amputation, and there was going to be a long road ahead. Now, I didn't know any of this at the time. I knew I had a broken foot. It was fairly obvious when I took off my, my armored boot. Um, but I started to get the message from my docs, uh, even from the first EMT on the scene and the ambulance. This was going to be a long road to recovery. I remember asking, um, do you think I'll make my Memorial Day cookout tomorrow? <laughs> Sorry, Travis, I don't think you're going to. It's a very sweet look people give you, like, oh, you're in shock. <laughs> um, so the point of all that is that I was looking at a long series of surgeries, a long series of hospitalization, the very real prospect that I was going to lose my foot. And um, spoiler alert, it's real. I saved it, it's all good. Um, but it took six surgeries altogether. And what I'm going to do here today to kind of kick things off is I'm going to tell you a particular story about an experience that I had in the hospital. My third hospitalization, it was my fifth surgery. Um, and the reason I tell this story is because it took me years, literally years, to figure this out, but I now see it as identifying one of the most important lessons in our attitude as a society about opioids. And so I'm gonna give you the kind of like, it took me several years to figure this out, now here's this little nugget that I think I found. Um, so, and hopefully it's a real nugget, and not just deluding myself, but that's, that's the goal, okay. So I was in my fifth surgery. This was on, what would have been June 15th, so about three weeks after the initial accident, third hospitalization. And the problem was, after the trauma surgeons had kind of pulled together all of the bones, um, they were hoping they would stitch together and that the foot would kind of revascularize and, and um, save itself, basically. There was still this big problem of uh, a, a very large wound and something I never thought of in my fairly fortunate life up to this point is that when you have a really large wound, like, what do you do with that? It's, you can't just like put a band-aid on it, you know? Uh, and you can't even just stitch it. There's no tissue there, right? And so the answer is, um, we are now magic, apparently, when it comes to medicine. And you can take one part of your body and put it on another part, and kind of sew everything together. And so my fifth surgery was called a free flap surgery where I took a big piece of my thigh and they plugged the hole in my foot with it. 
And so free flop surgeries or full tissue transfers are they take any number of tissues. And so for me it was skin, fat, muscle, artery to vascularize the new tissue, vein to take the blood away, and nerve because they wanted me to eventually be able to have sensation in my foot. So three surgical teams over the course of about nine hours are reconstructing my foot. And at the end, something I hadn't really thought about too much, was that I not only had a much expanded foot wound where they had done all of this work, they'd also uh, cut my leg open from my knee to my hip and harvested tissue. So I had yet another major surgical site at the end of three, works of three weeks of medicalization. When I woke up the next morning, kind of more fully out of anesthesia, I had never experienced pain like that in my life, and I had been hit by a van the previous month, right? It was, it was unbelievable, and I was terrified because I was already totally doped up, right? I mean, I had been on morphine, fentanyl, Dilaudid from the moment go, and I came out of anesthesia, and everything in my foot was on fire again because of all of that work, and I had this new surgical site that felt like electric, uh, I was terrified because this was this the new normal. So I started asking everybody for more medication. My nice nurses, residents, this big teaching hospital, big university, East Coast hospital, residents, interns, I need more meds, I need more drugs. This is terrible, I'm not gonna survive this. And things take a long time uh, in hospitals. And so finally, after many hours had gone by, it seemed like forever, I see the kind of flock of white coats walking through the ICU. So I'm in one of the ICU rooms. And if you know anything about hospitals, anybody in here work in a hospital? By the way, just get a temperature of the room a little bit. Okay. So if you know anything about hospitals, one of the things that happens at big teaching hospital is um, attending physicians, the physicians in charge of a particular division, go on rounds where they're then followed by a flock of, of doctors in training, interns and residents. Um, and so at my hospital, Johns Hopkins, I've been on these rounds, and they usually do it with the patient. Uh, with the patient, with the family, involve them in some way. But the group stood outside my room, which really made me angry, because I needed to talk to them about my pain. I heard them say, Mr. Reader, Mr. Reader. So I knew they were talking about me, and they finally come in at the end, and I wait for the pain question. You guys know the pain question? Please rate your pain on a scale of 0 to 10 zero being no pain and ten being the worst pain imaginable. We'll come back to the pain scale. But that was, that, I'd gotten really used to that, okay? And um, I'm waiting for that question to finally ask, and I'm like, it's so bad, it's terrible, I can't handle it. I've told everybody, why aren't you handling my pain? I'm a pretty nice guy. I didn't feel very nice in that moment. I felt pretty combative uh, and unhappy. And the ICU attending, I'll never forget this, most of the months of my life have actually kind of been wiped from my memory. If I had written it down, I think I would have forgotten a lot. But I remember this woman's reaction so clearly. She looks down at her clipboard, she's exasperated, she looks up at me and says, Yes, Mr. Reader, your repeated request for more pain medication has been noted. I'll discuss its appropriateness with my team. Those are her exact words. I was like, it's appropriateness, huh? Did you not look at my chart? The five surgeries I've had in the last three weeks, the pins sticking out of my foot, the appropriateness. I'm just thinking this because I'm way too nice. And she just like swoops out of the room. It's a weird thing that happens in an interaction like that. Does that interaction make sense to you? Does it fit a narrative? Do you, do you think, oh, I know what happened there? Or are you real confused? I'm looking around and read your face. I was real confused. But a lot of people I tell this story to are like, not that confused. Like, I know what happened there. What happened was, she treated me with suspicion, right? She treated me with suspicion because I was asking for the good drugs. I was being stigmatized because pain is a stigmatizing condition in a society where pain is treated with the good drugs, right? So in the language of uh, so much stigmatizing medicine these days, I was treated as a drug seeker, which let's just agree to never use that language again unless we're talking about someone using it. So, I was flush and ashamed and not knowing why I was ashamed and embarrassed and furious. And it took me a while and, and my partner, Sadia, who is a huge part of this story, um, she, she has like a, a life, uh, you know, she has to like work and make money and raise our kid while I'm just trying to not die. So she was actually at work that day and being without my advocate made me feel super vulnerable. And so I kind of lay in bed for a while, 
and wonder if I'm just going to die from the pain. And then I pull together all of my privilege, kind of like pull together all my all of my like middle class professorial white dude privilege, right? And I ask a nurse to get a hold of one of the residents of my free flap surgeon. So not the ICU doc who had just come through and treated me like garbage. The free flap surgeon is one of the best in the country at doing this thing where you take a part of your body and plug a hole in another part of your body. And one of her residents, clearly younger than me, um, was super nice, had stayed extra time to explain everything to me, had um, called me Dr. Reader instead of Mr. Reader, the only person in my entire healthcare encounter that did that, had asked me about my research. So that's the guy I wanted because I pulled my privilege together, right? And so I, I asked the nurse to get a hold of him, and I do, she, she gets him, and he comes to my room, and I, and I tell him, this is the way I've been treated, I'm dying, you gotta do something, he's like, don't worry, my attendant's gonna take care of you, she'll get a pain management consult. And he kept his word. So we got a pain management consult, and they gave me all the drugs. And the rest of my 10 days in that hospital, I floated into a very happy oblivion. Uh, they have all my doses of opioids. They give me something, uh, it's IV acetaminophen, which is basically just IV Tylenol. Really good. Did that blow your mind? It's just Tylenol, an IV form. I actually ended up doing some research about this later. I wrote a little piece in my book about it. Uh, they don't use it because it's super expensive because it's still on patents. Real good. The, word, the exact words I told my wife later was, as good as morphine in the short term. We can come back to that during Q&A if you want. It's super interesting. But that's a different story. Okay, so they gave me all the good drugs. They added something called gabapentin because that electric fire in my leg, it clipped out a nerve. When you clip out a nerve, you get a very different kind of pain and opioids aren't very good at that. So they added a different kind of painkiller that also has effects like dependence, potential for abuse. But doctors don't know that very much with gabapentin. We can come back to that too if you want another side story. Okay, here's how those two stories seem to me at the beginning. In the first month or so, I tell some people, some of my close friends and family, about the way my pain was treated, these two different ways. And here's the way it seemed to me. I was treated badly, I was treated real well, right? I was treated as a drug seeker, and I was given all the good stuff. That was not the right frame for what happened to me. Because here's what actually happened in that second part. Nobody talked to me at all about the pills they were giving me. There was no counseling. There was no plan, there was no strategizing. This pain management team came in and they performed magic. They got my pain under control, which I absolutely think was appropriate. But the only side effect that they warned me about, I wonder if any of you could guess, constipation. Boy, were they worried about my bowels. Everyone who came to my room was worried about my bowels. Not a single conversation about the potential for dependence, the need for an exit strategy to get off these pills at some point and no discussion about addiction. And a pretty fair response here would be, don't you have a PhD? Aren't you supposed to be smart? Um, supposed to be, I guess. I didn't know anything. Um, my wife's a research scientist. This isn't her field either. And it wasn't our job. And we were pretty traumatized, and we were trying to survive. So the result was that a couple of, well, about a month later, so a little over two months after the accident, I go back to my trauma surgeon, and he asked the pain question, he asked about my medication, and um, I give him the answer, and he, I kind of do the math, and I tell him how many pills I'm on, because every time my pain got worse, they just upped my dose, right? Here's a really perverse feature of these medications, some of you probably know about tolerance. Tolerance happens pretty quickly, and the tolerance to the pain relieving and euphoric effects of opioids happens really fast. So at some points, when the pain was at its worst, every week I'd get a higher dose. So I tell my doctor what I'm on, he says, Travis, that's, that's really high. You need to get off the meds now. And it was the first time anybody said anything to me about this. And I was totally caught off guard, so I never there. I'm like, uh, oh, okay. Um, nobody said anything, but okay, if we need to, well, you know, what's the protocol? He's like, well, uh, not my job. I didn't prescribe any of these pills. Um, who's been handling it recently, who's in the plastic surgeon. He's like, okay, go talk to the plastic surgeon, they'll give you a tapering regimen. So I did, and I went to the plastic surgeon who was totally unconcerned. In contrast to this trauma surgeon who'd been like, oh, you gotta get the meds. The plastic surgeon was like, uh, okay. 
and I kind of looked into him later. He's probably younger than me too, um, and probably fresh out of residency would be my guess. Now that I think about it, I looked into it later and what, where he makes his money. He does Brazilian butt tucks. I was like, as his money maker. Um, so of course he also does some reconstruction, and, and he connected me with the, the woman who saved my foot, for which I'm grateful. Um, but he was out of his league, and. Um, he told me, oh, okay, if you think about it, cut the pills into four, do all of them at the same time, go into oxycodone, and oxycotton, cut them all into four, drop a quarter each week, you'll be done in a month. And that sounded real dumb to us. Um, we didn't know anything, though, and so we asked. He was like, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem once you do that. So we, we did it. We started it. And so here's the point where um, Clay's very nicely mentioned that I, I gave a TED Talk. And here's where I say, the reason I gave this talk is so that I never have to do it again. Because it's real hard. And so I'm going to give you the Cliff's Notes version so that you get the story. And then if you want the really terrible, uh, dramatic version that makes me cry, then you can go watch it on your own when I'm not there. Um, 14 minutes. But I don't give that talk anymore, which is why I made it open access and, and can be findable. Um, so, so instead, I'll just give you the short version, which is this. When I tried to follow my doctor's advice, I went into withdrawal. And he'd given me this four week plan. And the first week was, was pretty bad. Um, I've never felt so sick in my life. But the kind of sick joke of withdrawal is that it gets worse as the percentage reduction goes up. And so if you drop a quarter of your starting dose each week, then the first one is a quarter, but the second one's a third third one is half, and the last one is 100%, and every week gets worse. And so as the weeks go on, Saudi and I are trying to get help because I think I'm dying, and nobody will help us. And I just want you to understand that we live on the East Coast in a big city. Um, I've been to three different hospitals with world-class doctors who put my foot back together. We had more than a dozen prescribers. We called every one of them, and then anyone else we could find on Google, and nobody would help. And the responses were anywhere between, the doctor won't talk to you, uh, to, uh, that's not our job, because we do this other thing. Even my pain management team, we finally got my pain management team at the hospital, they wouldn't talk to us, they sent a nurse to say, we prescribe opioids, we don't take them. Uh, they, did that. they said that because they're an inpatient service. We found an independent pain management clinic, not associated with the hospital, who can't say that. And they say, yeah, we can evaluate you for more opioids if you ran out of your prescription, but we don't do tapering. We finally got those sorts of people to give us a suggestion. They said, well, you probably need addiction medicine. Uh, which didn't seem right at the time, because I didn't feel addicted, I just felt sick. Um, and then when I kind of had time later to think on this and to do some research, it's terrible advice. And one of the reasons it's terrible advice is because our addiction infrastructure system is massively overworked. And about one in 10 people with substance use disorder actually get treatment. The big reason for that is we don't have enough people to do it. So when I called them, which I did, they very sweetly said, you're not our problem, honey. Because I'm trying to get off the meds. They're transitioning people into methadone and buprenorphine and connecting them with counseling and wraparound services, which is what they should be doing. But I was not their job. The end of the story is, by the time I'm getting to week three and four, the only advice doctors would give me is go back on the meds. If you feel like you're in that much trouble, go back on the meds. And I told my wife these exact words. I said, if I go back on these meds, I'll never get off them. And I wasn't being dramatic or hyperbolic. I was saying to her, I'm admitting to myself, I won't, let, I won't be able to do this again. And so if we make that call that to save my life, I have to go back on these pills, we just need to know that I'm on them forever, whatever that means. And so we tried and we pushed through, and at the end, um, for the first time in my life, I was, I was suicidal. I was thinking about how long I would be able to, to live. And that's the end of that story that I'm going to tell for now. Um, what happened to, to get me to here is that I did decide to go back on the pills. But I decided I would do it the lowest dose possible, and um, so we just committed to that. That was what we needed to do. But the night that I decided I'm giving up, I actually went to bed, which I hadn't slept in four days, hadn't been to bed in four weeks, and I put the pills on my nightstand and said, I'm not going to do it until I absolutely feel like I have to. And that night I fell asleep. 
there was no magic there. I timed out. Withdrawal is a process. And this was the last week. I had nothing in my system. Withdrawal timed out. It was about day eight. And I slept for about six hours that night. And when I woke up, I felt like I could do it. I could finish this process. So I never did take any of the pills. But that was just luck. I was ready. I was ready to if I needed them. So here's the question. How in the world did we get here? And by here, I mean... It's not only the case that I had my medication really badly managed. And I would tell this story to my friends and, and, and loved ones, and they'd say, no wonder we're in an opioid epidemic in this country. Which, let's hold that thought, because solving my problem is not going to solve the epidemic. So we'll come back to that at the end, right? But the kind of inability to manage this drug would lead to people to say, no wonder we're in crisis. But that's not the only question I have, how did we get here? Because I also had this drug withheld from me on the same day in the same hospital by doctors who clearly thought there was something dangerous about this drug, or that I shouldn't get it, or that I wasn't entitled to it, because I might be lying, right? So this is my question. How do we get to a place where this, one of the central tools in pain management in medicine is something that we are so bad at understanding and handling that at the same hospital, in a big city, in a world-class institution, on the same day, two doctors treated me in the exact opposite, equally wrong ways. I had my pain undertreated, and I had my pain massively, aggressively overtreated. Where I probably needed the dose they gave me on that day, but overtreatment is something like irresponsible use of the medication. Right? I spent two years trying to find the answer to this question. Because I'm a geek, right? This is what I do for a living. I'm a researcher, I'm a professor. And so when I finally got enough distance from the trauma, and I could look at it objectively, I said, I need to, I need to find the answer to this, because I can't be the only one. Okay? And I think I found the answer. And the answer is, is actually pr pretty cool. It's pretty interesting. And I say that, I know it sounds a little perverse, but I think we can understand this. I think we can get a grip on this, right? So the next thing I want to do is I want to tell you a little story about the history of how we've dealt with these drugs, these medicines, in our country and in the world. Because I think if we understand how bad we've always been at this, we'll get a sense of what we need to do, all right? So I'm going to tell you a story, and, and it sounds really bad, because I'm like, I'm going to tell you 5,000 years of history, but I can do it in 10 minutes, I promise. So don't fall asleep. OK. So, this is the poppy plant. If you've never seen it, this is the source of our magic. Okay? So at least 5,000 years, we've had access to opium. And that's because this plant doesn't take much. The milky substance, what you do is you take a knife, and you pour the unripe poppy plant, and it milks out this kind of sticky liquid. You let it dry in the sun, you scrape it off, let it dry a little bit more until it turns into powder. You can smoke it, you can rub it on your gums, you can eat it, you can ingest it in different ways. Here's the thing about opium. It's real good, but it's not that good. And that's important, because in 5,000 years, we haven't had that many problems with it. Yes, we've been had problems. We fought wars over it. You ever heard of the opium wars, right? But it hasn't done what it's doing to us today until we get to the first time a couple hundred years ago. And that's because it's just, it's just not that strong. The active ingredients are the alkaloids in opium morphine coating at the vein. They make up a relatively small amount of it. And you were ingesting it. You had, had to go through the liver first. It's not that efficient, right? So it's a real good drug uh, for thousands of years. It's far better than anything else we had. The habit formation wasn't a huge problem, and it certainly wasn't that deadly. What changed all that was fast forward all the way up to the 19th century. In the 1800s, two really important things happened. First, scientists identified morphine. The main, the strongest, most potent alkaloid in opium. And they were able to extract just the morphine. So that if you took the morphine and rubbed it on your gums, or you smoked it, or you snorted it, way more powerful. It still wasn't going to kill that many people. And that's a distasteful thing to say, because it can kill you absolutely. But it still wasn't the best way to get it into your brain. And so the other thing that happened right about the same time, within a few decades, is we finally invented the hypodermic syringe. So up until this point, you had to ingest the drug, but now you can inject it directly in your veins. 
So we went from having opium, which is pretty weak and you had to ingest it, you know, orally, to now we've got the most potent aspect of it, you can inject it directly into your veins. And I don't know whether this is apocryphal or not, but the story is that the first death recorded from an injected overdose of morphine was the wife of the guy who invented the hypodermic syringe. Because that's how powerful it is. You take a bunch of morphine and you shoot it in your veins. Here's what happens to your brain, right? I don't know if we're gonna do any of the science later, but you get all these receptors. The morphine, it turns out, mostly the mu receptor. You plug a bunch of the morphine into it, and the more you get, the more it does all of the things that it does. It causes euphoria, analgesia, but also things like sedating the respiratory system. Right? And so you get more and more, you can engage more and more of these receptors, you take fewer and fewer breaths. If any of you have been on really high doses of fentanyl or hydromorphone in the hospital, right? If they're worried about your breathing and they're watching your oxygen levels, which they watch for four weeks for me in the hospital, get down 90s, 80s, 70% oxygen level. Uh, the reason is because you're flirting with overdose. Your respiratory system is sedating, which is the process that kills people when they shoot heroin. It's the same thing. So, we get these two inventions, uh, the invention of the hypodermic syringe, the identification of morphine, and now we have real problems. And it's not just because this becomes accessible, but because in America we start fighting a war. The Civil War is bloody and terrible and results in tons of traumatic injury and blown off limbs. And the number of soldiers that developed an addiction, they called habit, out of morphine, was so high that by the end of the 19th century they were calling it soldier's disease. That's what addiction was. It's worth noting, though, it wasn't only the soldiers, because in particular, fairly wealthy white women uh, who had access to doctors and pharmacists, so you had a, a kind of problem of privilege here. They had access and money. They would go to the pharmacist and get morphine for everything. Because of that respiratory sedation, it was really good for tuberculosis, for influenza. Right? It would help your breathing, allow you to sleep. So morphine was used for everything, and by the end of the 19th century, it was killing thousands of people. So according to most historians, this was for America's first opioid epidemic. So we call today the opioid epidemic, that's one of them. It's the new one, right? The first one was morphine. But we weren't over it yet, we weren't done yet, because this kicked off what I now think of as like the pharmaceutical search for the Holy Grail. We got scared enough of morphine that we started thinking, hey companies, researchers, folks who are looking into chemicals, uh, here's what we need. We need pain management that won't kill people, that won't get them hooked. A less addictive version of morphine. And so this kicks off the very beginning of an arms race that's still going on, by the way. Do you read anything in the news about what pharmaceutical companies are doing now to look for the next big thing? We're still asking the same question. How do you get the benefit, benefits of morphine, or now we say Oxycontin, without the side effects, right? being less addictive. So a little company in Germany, no one had heard of, they used to specialize in coal tar dye. Um, they thought they solved this, this question. And so one of their chemists um, basically was trying to synthesize codeine. And he accidentally synthesized uh, diacetylmorphine. And if there are any chemists in the audience, you know what's coming. So we got diacetylmorphine, and he's trying it out on rats, and the rats really like it. And so he and his colleagues start trying it out on themselves, and they really like it. And so they start calling this drug heroish for the heroic feeling that it gives them when they're sampling their own products. Right? So heroish, of course, when it is patented and sold in English, becomes heroin. And that little company in Germany, anyone know who it was? You know the story? Bayer, maker of aspirin. It's about five years before aspirin came. So Bayer releases heroin in 1898, and Heinrich Dreiser, the head of their pharmaceutical division, relatively new, tells the world that he has solved the problem because he has found a stronger, non-addictive opioid. I have no idea why he thought this. I mean, the stronger part's true. The non-addictive part, I don't know why he thought this was true, but he told it to doctors, he wrote it in medical journals, uh, he would sell it to pharmacists, and they told everyone, and as a matter of fact, it was so good that 1898, it hits the market. In the early 1900s, it's not only being marketed for everything. Your baby's fussy, rub it on their gums, okay? Menstrual cramps, take a little heroin. Headache, heroin for you, okay? Not only that good, but if you have a morphine addiction, treat it with heroin. 
So what was probably going to be an epidemic anyway, absolutely explodes at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century. And we have an unprecedented, growing, no sign of peaking epidemic public health crisis. So by about 1908, uh, President, then President Teddy Roosevelt looks around and says, what, what are we gonna do? He appoints the nation's basically first opioid czar. This is Hamilton Wright, a Midwest physician, pretty uncomplicated view of drugs. He goes on record saying, Americans are the biggest drug fiends in the world. And so he starts cracking down on drug use. And the thing that I want you to take from this little history lesson is, 1908 is the appointment of Hamilton Wright. By 1914, they passed the Narcotics, the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, regulate and heavily tax narcotics and big heroin. By 1924, you get the Heroin Act, which outlaws heroin. So 1908 to 1924, this is the crackdown. This is basically the beginning of the war on drugs. This is what I want you to, this is how far back that history goes. So the war on drugs becomes popular language in the latter half of the 20th century, right? This has its roots in a prohibitionist idea that starts in 1908, right? So what we get, oh, I forgot to show you my pretty picture of heroin. The lighting here is not super helpful, but here's the heroin that was sold in every pharmacy for everything. Uh, so what you get is this unprecedented epidemic. How do we react to it? Well, we take away people's drugs. This has got to be the answer, right? The drugs cause the problem, you attack the supply. Does that sound familiar? That's the mechanism of the war on drugs. It's the mechanism that we're basically still using, and we use that language when we talk about whether it's good, and we talk about whether the evidence bears it out. It's still the discussion we're having, right? So um, that prohibition era starts in 1908, basically settles in. And what I'm trying to draw for you is this pendulum swing. So do you feel this, right? So when we finally start getting the powerful stuff, we swing all the way towards, whoa! <laughs> Someone should have been able to predict that. I apologize to whatever problem this just became. Not real sure what to do, so just keep going. Just gonna, just gonna keep talking about drug war. Okay. Um, so we get this pendulum swing that knocks off water. All right. So the pendulum swings aggressively towards permission, embrace. We have this really powerful drug that makes us happy. Give it out to everyone, like candy. It kills everyone it comes in contact with. It's not it's an exaggeration, right? It kills so many people. And so we freak out and we say, the drug is causing this problem. Attack the drug and the pendulum slams back towards prohibition. And what happened here is it lodged in place by early, from the early 20th century all the way up to, well, I mean, so think about the war on drugs when it comes about, but specifically for pharmaceuticals. Think about how hard medicine would be if you were scared to death of opioids, right? So for the entire 20th century, we have this really tense relationship where we're prohibitionists about opioids because we saw what heroin did and morphine before it. But we're getting better at surgery, so we're doing more of it. People are living longer, so they're living long enough to get really painful conditions like cancer at a higher rate. So we're, we're in this massive progressive time span where medicine is progressing and we need more and more pain care because of what we're doing with medicine. And we're still scared of it. And so this tension kind of comes to a head, late 60s, early 70s, lots of stuff comes together. You have the kind of civil rights era that, that makes language of rights um, uh, actionable, and so you get patients' rights language modeled after a civil rights sort of movement, and you have the birth of the palliative care field. So you have people like Kathleen Foley, who's widely acknowledged to be one of the pioneers of palliative care. She walks into her cancer center for her first job, and she sees these patients suffering terribly, and they're not on any meds. And she asks them why, and they and the doctors say, well, they don't want to become addicted. And they're dying. They're in stage cancer, right? So what we get is we get all, a whole bunch of forces coming together, a pain advocacy movement, a palliative care movement. We start to really think pain is something we have to pay attention to. And so this pushes us towards, let's come back to our pain scale, right? This scale, that zero to 10 scale that you get asked every time when you go see your doctor about pain, that was the simple solution to this 
really, really hard question of how do you take pain seriously as a doctor? If I'm trying to treat your pain, your pain is subjective. I can't access it with a painometer, right? It's not the sort of thing that an x-ray helps me with. And so this gives us data. It gives us something actionable. This was the culmination of that long movement, and this is happening by the late 90s. But it probably wouldn't have been enough to get us where we are by itself. Something else had happened because we were still scared of addiction. That prohibitionist mindset hadn't gone away, and we hadn't forgotten heroin, right? What happened was another pharmaceutical player came on the field, right? A hundred years before 1898, had been Bayer saying heroin solves our problem, it's non-addictive opioid. So we needed that same message. We needed somebody to tell us they found a drug that's not addictive so we would actually use it. And we got it. Another small company that pretty much no one knew about, and um, they said, we solved your problem for us. In 1996, just the irony is too much, you know, almost exactly 100 years later, and they come out and they say, we have a less addictive opioid for you. It's so powerful and so non-addictive, you should use it for all pain, moderate to severe. And that drug you've probably heard of, that's OxyContin. And that little company was pretty good. And I always have to mention here, because there's a danger that people think you're just being opinionated and editorializing and hate corporations. This isn't my opinion. They admitted criminal wrongdoing. Uh, they were, uh, they pled guilty to the criminal charge of misbranding, which resulted in increased addiction and death. They paid $634.5 million in 2007, admitting criminal wrongdoing. And you may have just heard this two weeks ago, they paid out another $270 million. And the family, the Sackler family, who owns the company, for the first time paid personal money of $65 million. They're investigating bankruptcy because there are 1,600 lawsuits against them. Right? So I want you to understand this is not me being opinionated and, and corporations are bad. This corporation is bad. Right? And they played a big role in what happened. So OxyContin comes out and they play this role that heroin played before where they say it's not addictive so you can be less scared. And so again, doctors start prescribing like crazy. They, they needed this. They wanted this. You talk to doctors who lived through this transition, which I work with a bunch of them. I talk to them in my research. They were relieved. Now, a bunch of them were sketched out. A bunch of them hated Purdue because it felt terrible when they came in and said, you should prescribe this dangerous drug. But a bunch of them were relieved because the country had started telling them, treat pain seriously. Kathleen Foley had kind of coined this phrase that became a, a, a line for the pain advocacy movement. It says, failure to treat pain constitutes torture by omission. So there was this entire generation of doctors who felt like we were telling them as a society, stop torturing your patients. And now they could, because finally somebody was giving them a drug that said that it was safe to give patients, so they could stop torturing their patients. The result is exactly what you'd think it was. 100 years before, giving out addictive drugs like candy as a result of the desire to treat resulted in an epidemic, and it did this time too. Right? So to be clear, OxyContin isn't the only drug and Purdue's not the only bad player, right? But also to be clear, OxyContin came out in 1996. And by 2000, the year 2000, it was a billion dollar a year drug. By the year 2006, it was a three and a half billion dollar a year drug. Between 1999 and 2011, prescribing of opioids quadrupled. This is where we entered the the war on pain decade. Give medicine to everyone. And Purdue was one of several companies that was paying physicians to go out and spread the good word. Paying societies like the American Pain Society to say pain is now the fifth vital sign. Pain is the fifth vital sign became a standard across the entire country. That's part of why we had the zero to 10 scale. Purdue was one of the funders of the organization who coined that term, right? This was orchestrated, and in 11 years, 12 years, we had a 400% rise in prescribing. And here's the purple line. You can probably barely see it on this graph. 99 to 2011, the overdose death rate from prescription opioids rose 400%. It's a perfect trend line match. Now, the red arrows here, what these are for is to give you a sense of the timing of my story. We're going to merge the stories now. So look at what happens in 2011. That purple line's been going up. The overdose death rate from prescription opioids has quadrupled since 1999. And then it peaks and starts dropping. Why in the world would it peak? 
because we started freaking out about an opioid epidemic. And we started telling doctors no longer that you are torturing your patients by failing to treat, now you're killing your patients by prescribing. And so we start to squeeze the supply balloon because what do you do in response to an epidemic if you think the drugs are the problem? You squeeze the supply of the drug. And prescription was the supply of this stage of the epidemic. So we squeezed the supply and prescribing peaked between 2010 and 2012. So now look at prescription deaths, peaked in 2011. If focusing on supply works, what would happen is the overdose death rate total would go down. That's not what happens. What are the other lines on this graph? Heroin, illicit fentanyl. So when we, start de when we start decreasing prescription opioids, we do start decreasing the number of people dying from prescription opioids. What happens when somebody has an addiction and you have their supply of pure pharmaceutical grade drug taken away? Addiction doesn't respond to reason. That's the hallmark of addiction. It's enacting bad, enacting bad decisions, facing bad consequences, even though you know they're bad consequences. Okay? It's compulsive behavior even in the face of bad consequences. So, a lot of these people will turn into the black market if they no longer have access to their drugs. And that's why heroin deaths spike immediately after prescription overdose deaths start to lower. And now we have a fentanyl crisis because when you drive a huge number of people to the heroin market, there's something called the Iron Law of, uh, Iron Law of Prohibition. It's called the Iron Law of Black Market. The Iron Law of Prohibition, which basically says when you prohibit something, you will incentivize the people who are marketing that to make it more and more efficient. So to make heroin more and more portable, make it smaller and smaller, more and more powerful, and fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine. So, 2011 is when we hit this peak, and then the era in 2015, that's when I land in the hospital. Bring this long story back together. The reason I think this is an answer to my question is because when I learned that history, I was suddenly absolutely not surprised by the way I was treated in the hospital. Because of course, people are under treating pain out of fear. We started squeezing the supply in 2011. We're terrified of this drug because prohibition seems like a pretty good response to a drug that's killing people. But there's also still entire generations of doctors who were told, don't torture your patients, treat their pain aggressively. And the existence of my pain management team at a world-class hospital basically is there because of the decade on pain. That's when those teams were formed as a result of this push towards treating pain. So I'm no longer surprised at all that I was treated in these contradictory ways, both of them bad, because we suck at treating pain with opioids. Here's what we do. We swing the pendulum back and forth between total prohibition and radical embrace. And both of them are really, really bad solutions to a dangerous drug. Right. So here's my very simple lesson. I'm going to open this so carefully. It's um, my very simple lesson from all of that. We have to stop swinging the pendulum. And that's not going to give us a ton of information on its own, but just, just on, its, on its face, I want you to understand how much harder that's going to be. Because if you're reading a lot of op-eds that are saying things like doctors are killing us, they need to you know, pull back their prescription pads, those are problematic arguments. And so if you take nothing else away, I want you to understand, those are problematic arguments. Does prohibition with prescription pain management work? No, absolutely doesn't work. And the result to get of prohibition is going to be that we let like cancer patients die in pain, and then we freak out about that, so we look for the next wonder drug, and someone will make it, because they'll make them billions of dollars, and then they'll push it on us, and we'll embrace it, and then 100,000 people will die, and we'll freak out again. Not a good system, right? Okay, so here's my super helpful, incredibly vague diagram, right? <laughs> Diagramming our attitude towards opioids. We can give opioids out like candy, give them to everybody. That's gonna to lead to a public health crisis every time. It happened with morphine, it was exacerbated by heroin, it happened with Oxycontin, it was exacerbated by incisus fentanyl, right? Everybody who's gotten into this has made it worse. But if we go back to prohibition, we just said that doesn't work either. So you gotta do something in the middle. 
And then, of course, the question is, what in the world does that look like? So I, I gave you a big picture lesson, which philosophers love. Uh, let, let other people handle that. Um, but I'm not a pure philosopher anymore, and now I work in the mud with physicians and public health scientists, and so they do want me to say something a little more helpful. So I'm gonna... <laughs> so I'm gonna give you just a few points of advice, and, and, and we want time for questions, right? People are gonna chat. Okay, so what I'm gonna try to do is I'm gonna try to end with about 15 minutes, and we can chat, and I'll be here the rest of the day so we can talk more. So here are some, like, initial conversations. And, um, we're not, we're not going to solve this. Tate, Tate said we're not going to solve the opioid crisis. We're also not going to solve just the prescription opioid crisis. We're not going to solve pain management today. But here are a couple of things that you may not have heard about that could be really helpful. And um, we can be kind of like, um, you know, go out like little tendrils in the environment and spread it. That's why I wrote a book, basically. So I, I think I found a few things. Here's the question that everybody asks about prescription opioids. How many is too many? When are we prescribing badly? And this really plays into that op-ed story of doctors have been killing us, they should put their prescription pads away, right? So this question, I think, is pretty ill-formed because it's pretty unnuanced. But there's a kernel of truth to it. And the kernel of truth is we've actually, in fact, been really bad about prescribing opioids at all in a whole bunch of cases. How many of you gotten a tooth pulled, wisdom tooth extracted, and then take on home with a bottle of Vicodin or Percocet? Raise your hand. That's Awful! That should never have happened. And, and I'm sure that there are at least a few people in here like, but it felt a lot better. And I, I wouldn't have enjoyed it without, that's totally true. And pain sucks. And it turns out life is painful sometimes, right? The kind of pain that you get with a tooth pull, turns out, so we now have evidence on this, is treated really well by insects, ibuprofen, right? A lot of the pain that comes with a wisdom tooth pull has to do with swelling. You knock the swelling down with an inset, it's as effective in some randomized clinical trials as opioids. Which means not only should we just be able to deal with some moderate acute pain, but we can actually use ibuprofen with for short term as way better side effect profile. Okay? So um, the ADA now agrees. I'm not saying anything controversial. The American Dental Association has basically told dentists, stop doing that. That was terrible. For a long time during the war on, war on pain, um, dentists were the second highest prescribers in the country. General practitioners? Dentists. Pain docs and surgeons were down here, right? Everyday pain is what people were taking these pills for. All right, so that's really important. But then there's also the case that um, docs would write prescriptions for some number of pills. So how many of you have been in, how many of you in here have had a surgery, some kind of procedure that probably did require opioids, or at least opioids were very helpful for, but you were left with like a half a bottle at the end, and you're just kind of like, huh, what am I going to do with that? third of a bottle, half a bottle, you're just like, you got a bunch of pills left. So here's something that might surprise you a little bit, or maybe not at this point. We had no evidence base for how many pills to prescribe you for that procedure. And I can say that with confidence without knowing you, because we had no evidence base for any procedure. For 20 some years, we aggressively prescribed opioids in response to pain, and we had no study set. There was no literature that said, for a knee replacement, you'll probably need 32 more for um, an arm break, you probably need 12 Vicodin. For an arm break, you actually don't need Vicodin, by the way. Um, so we had none of that data, and so we made it up. So at some point, a doctor was like, well, 30 is a nice round number, so I'll, assign 30, I'll prescribe 30 pills. And then that attending was responsible for training residents. And so the residents were like, hey, how many pills do I write for this guy with a broken arm? It's like, ah, oh, 30. And that became the norm. Ever wonder why all of the pills come in 30, 45, 60, 90? It's because they're nice round numbers. That's literally the reason we picked those prescription rates. Right? Okay, so we need a huge evidence base and we're finally starting to get it. Uh, a colleague and friend of mine up at the University of Michigan named Chad Brummett has started an organization called Michigan Open, the Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network. And they are probably doing more to address this part of the, the problem than anybody else in the country. The first study they did was on gallbladder surgery, and what they wanted to do was figure out how much, oh, how many opioids doctors actually prescribed for the surgery, how many pills people actually took, and then see how much they could reduce without cost. And so they go and ask all the doctors, and they standardize everything into morphine milligram equivalents, which is a nice measure, okay? And so uh, they ask, how many morphine milligram equivalents do you prescribe for your gallbladder surgery? 
I should have looked this up because I forgot it the other day. I think it was 225 was the initial, or 275, that's what it was, 275. So 275 morphine milligram equivalents. So then they started asking patients, how many did you actually use? The answer was 35. So they did a really short, easy, pretty much costless intervention, which was they told doctors this information, said they don't need as much. They told patients this information, said after the surgery, only well, going to a few pills for a few days, some pain is normal, you need to be able to feel the pain so that you can respond to your body when it's doing well or not well, don't medicate yourself into oblivion. That small intervention went into effect, they reduced prescribing to 75 morphine milligram equivalents, still more than the 35 that most people were taking, no increase in refills. They've done this now with dozens of surgeries. And the answers are usually pretty consistent, that you need to prescribe something like a third to as half as many as people were doing. All right, so this is a really easy place. Think of this as like ethical, low-hanging fruit. Don't, don't send a bunch of dangerous pills out of the world. Here's what happens. It's not that most of your parents and grandparents who are having more of these procedures and getting more of these pills, it's not that most of them are going to become addicted, although some of them will. What's actually going to happen? You're going to put them in their medicine cabinet just in case. You don't want to throw these away. They're sometimes hard to get, right? And what, what happens when they're in the medicine cabinet? You know, never heard of nephews? They're like teenage kids? <laughs> these have a huge black market value, a dollar per milligram for oxycodone, right? So you sell them, you give them to your friends. Diversion is one of the huge problems in the starts of people's medicine cabinets, okay? So that's one piece. Here's the last one I'm going to give you. Now, especially with the lighting, this graph's a little bit hard, but I want you to understand it because it will make your head explode, okay? So this, what this graph shows is it shows the likelihood, if you're opioid naive, which means you are not taking opioids, you haven't for several months, maybe never have. So if you are opioid naive, and then you need opioids for some acute injury, for surgery, what is the likelihood that one and three years later, so one is the top salt line, three is the lower dotted line, what is the likelihood that you will still be on opioids one and three years later, right? So one of the data sets that we, one of the things we know about opioids now is that they are not good for long-term chronic pain for the most part. So being on opioids for one and three years is almost never good. This is evidence based that we've generated only in the last four years, right? So basically everybody who's on opioids one and three years later, that was a bad decision and they're doing worse for it. There are some exceptions, we can talk about that later if you want. So what's the percentage likelihood? So the starting point here is for a single day's prescription, if you get a single day's prescription of opioids, there's a 6% chance that you'll still be on them a year later. That's already a really serious adverse event. If there's a 6% chance, six people out of 100 are gonna have this, that's a really serious adverse event. So that's already bad, but it's not why I'm showing you this graph. Why I'm showing you this graph is for the two jumps. This one? after day 10, and that one's after day 30. Day 10 and day 30, these are nice round numbers. Doctors with no evidence base often would say, oh, this is really minor, I'll give you 10 days. Oh, this is a pretty serious one, I'll give you 30 days. If you go past those two points, this is a study that was done for the CDC, by the way, since I realized you can't see my citation. Um, so if you go past day 10, 11 days plus, your chance of being on the pills a year later jumps to almost 25%. One in four. What happens if you go past that magic month point? You get that 31st day prescription, it jumps to over 40%. 40 out of 100 people that are given more than a month's prescription will still be on the pills a year later. The reason I think this is really important, given the story that I told you about my experience, is one of the things that we haven't talked about explicitly is dependence. And opioid dependence is just a biological feature of the drug. It's not the same thing as addiction. It is the fact that when you take opioids, so addiction is a pretty small rate, actually. So for all the people who take opioids, very few of them are going to become addicted. I think it's somewhere between 0.6 and 6% of the population. It's a wide range, it's hard to get data, okay? Dependence happens to everyone. It's just part of how the drugs work. If you take opioids for long enough, your brain becomes used to them. What is your brain? It's a fancy learning machine. It tries to achieve homeostasis. It wants to balance out. So it reacts less strongly in the presence of opioids. That means it gets used to them. Tolerance is a part of this. You need more to get the same effect. And when you take the drug away, you go into withdrawal. 
Withdrawal is not associated with the psychological health condition of addiction. It can be, but it's not necessarily. Withdrawal is just the feature of the drug, that it's the absence of the drug when someone's dependent. Why does this make a ton of sense? Because the longer you're on the drug, the more it hurts when you stop taking it. If you've had surgery, and you think about how much life is terrible after a surgery, it's terrible in all sorts of ways, and if you stop taking your pain meds, and you're even worse in all sorts of ways, here's a really reasonable thing to think. I guess I wasn't ready to stop taking my meds yet. So you take them longer. But the longer you take them, the more dependent you become, the worse the withdrawal comes. And when you try to stop taking them again later, the harder it is, it is yet. My withdrawal story that I told you about happened after two months on, to be fair, like really high, inappropriate, at high doses. But look at this one in three year point. If you've been on opioids for one in three years, dependence and withdrawal are going to make your life very, very hard. Right? This is a terrifying graph, and I think it's one of the most important things that we should acknowledge, because basically here's, here's the lesson. Right? So what can we do to think about responsible prescribing in light of all that I've said? It's not that simple thing of, should doctors put their prescription pads away, right? The first point is appropriate initiation. Yeah, dentist, stop it, right? Um, someone comes in the ER with a broken bone, look at the literature, long bone breaks, well treated with acetaminophen and ibuprofen. You typically don't need Vicodin or Percocet for long bone break. We have data on this, randomized control trials. All right, so appropriate initiation is important. But here's the other part. Signing your name on the prescription if you're a doctor, is not the only point of contact between you and the patient. It's not like you get to be like, here you go, 120 oxycodone, have a nice life, right? Because the doctor's job, why do we have prescription pads? Why do we have drug schedules? It's because doctors are supposed to protect us from the harmful side effects of these drugs. And if they were just over the counter, like heroin used to be, anyone could have access to them. It's the doctor's job as expert, or the, the PAs, or the nurse practitioners, other people with prescribing licenses. It's their job to protect us from the drug. So the management is a key component. Think back to that graph, right? Don't let your patient be one of the people that goes past day 10 if they don't have to be. That's an important part of management. And a really important part is discontinuation. How do you solve the problem of dependence, intolerance, and withdrawal? You actually have to know how to taper a patient, which none of my doctors did. And then when we called around and tried to find someone, maybe some of them knew, but I was not their job. The hot potato kept getting passed, right? So I want to be clear here at the end that suppose everybody was like, thank you, Travis, you just solved this. We're going to do everything you said. <laughs> I addressed a problem with prescription opioids, and I showed how it fed into the opioid crisis. I want, to, I want you to make sure that you know this is a small part of the opioid crisis. Remember that graph I showed you? Prescription opioid deaths started going down in 2011. Now they've gone back up since then, which ain't great. But the majority of the problem is illicit fentanyl and heroin. So this is important because pain management and medicine are important. And you can't let physicians practice irresponsible medicine in a way that can lead to a public health epidemic. We have to fix this. But there's the whole rest of the epidemic to deal with. This is a tiny piece. And I'm happy to talk about any of that as well through the rest of the day. I think the other panelists are going to do some of the really important stuff on addiction and harm reduction. So I will leave that to them. Thank you very much for all of your attention. Happy to answer questions. The book that Thais told you about is called In Pain. Uh, it comes out on June 18th. Um, if you thought this was interesting, I kind of gave you a trailer into the book, basically. And I'm um, happy to talk more. Thanks much. Counsel well, could I could I fix things, right? Um, so one way to answer it is I ended up having to have another surgery well after all this happened. And it was always part of the plan um, because when you take plug a hole with one part of your in one part of your body with another part, you take more tissue than you need because better to have too much than to have too little, right? Um, and you have to wait for six to eight months till the swelling goes down so that you can cut off everything that's excess. So I had another plastic surgery planned for six months after all of this happened. And you might expect that I was terrified. Right? I'd gone through withdrawal, I'd come out of it. I never wanted to touch these drugs again. And so then, here's the other thing that I did where I kind of pulled together all of my privilege. I work at Johns Hopkins. 
And so it took me several months. I kind of finally got over the stigma and the shame because no one knew my story. Everyone knew my story about my foot being blown apart. All the doctors went to see the pictures, right? But no one knew about the opioids because of stigma, right? It took me a long time to figure out that I could do things like this, talk about it openly. Uh, so finally, I got over that, and I found a pain doc at Hopkins and said, hey, can I talk to you about this problem I have? I need to go on medication that I'm afraid of. And because I'm a faculty member at Hopkins, he's like, oh, I could do one of my like spots that I hold for friends and family. And so I got access that very few people have, and he and I talked through it, and then I was able to reason, right? So then I had the information I should have had all along. You know, he told me about kind of timelines for dependence, different sensitivities, what kind of pain I should manage and what sort of pain I should medicate, right? Because it is important to medicate pain when you have really severe pain because you can't recover if your body can't rest, right? So this is one of the things that doctors are really concerned with. But it's also really important not to medicate yourself into slobbering on the floor because you need to know when your body's not doing what it should, which means you have to be able to feel it. And so we had long conversations about that. For my sixth surgery then, uh, I was terrified that I got five milligram Percocet, so five milligram oxycodone with acetaminophen. And I committed to taking at the very worst moments, only then, and being off as soon as I could. And I took longer than I wanted to. I took at least one pill a day for two weeks, two or three pills a day a lot at the beginning. But doing it that way, only medicating when I needed to, not being on it around the clock so it doesn't let your brain kind of reset to this new normal, uh, no withdrawal, no dependence at the end of about 10 to 15 days, kind of depending on how you count. Now, I had a very special kind of knowledge by that point. I had visceral, terrified knowledge, right? And it's unclear whether anyone could have told me in the ICU in a way that would have made me do that, right? Because I was also real scared of the pain. But they needed to do more than they did. And so part of what I think, part of the conversation that a lot of us need to have is we need to be more prepared for when we land in the ICU unexpectedly so that an idea about pain and how we should treat it. But then the physicians and the nurses and the nurse practitioners and the PAs, they need to be really on our case about what looks like appropriate use of this medication in a non-stigmatizing, non-judgmental way. It's not like my ICU docs all discuss its appropriateness, right? But more like, I'm worried about you. Do you know about the mechanism of dependence? It's going to make it hard if you don't think about this, right? Which nobody said those words to me, yeah. So uh, it's not going to be easy. And one of the nice things about your question there is, now, I wouldn't have been like magically, ha, I'm going to take a quarter of what I did and it'll be fine, right? I was terrified of the pain, but I would have been more prepared. Who else? Yes, ma'am. I'm thinking about the system where doctors have increasing pressure to see patients for a short amount of time. Um, everything's computerized now. And so I'm wondering, again, I'm not a doctor at all, so I'm a social worker, but I'm wondering what do you think would Yeah, such a good question. So there are all of these pressures on doctors, and I do, when, toward the end of the book, I lay them all out in one chapter, and it's so depressing when you read them just side by side, right? Because basically what I do is I lay out all the incentives that doctors have to just write a script. Okay. So first thing is, I've got no time. I'm in a managed healthcare system. You come in, you say pain. If I say no, you're going to fight, and we're going to be here forever, and I'm going to get behind, and there are patients out in the waiting room. So time. It's just like, write a script, I'm done. Okay? But the other thing is, when they get upset because I'm telling them no, they're going to rate me. Uh, they're going to evaluate me online, and that's bad for business. But then if I work for a hospital, the hospital is also going to send out a survey, a patient satisfaction survey. And the hospital and the doctor's reimbursement can be tied to pain satisfaction scores. We did that during the decade of pain because we wanted doctors to be incentivized to take pain seriously. So now, if I give everybody a script who wants one, I get great scores. If I give no one a script who wants one, I can expect to be absolutely blasted, and it can affect my job if I'm a doctor, right? Um, I also am directly incentivized by pharma. Doctors get payments, right? They get speaking gigs. Uh, you can't get direct kickbacks, that would be illegal. But you can get nice paid speaking gigs in Tahiti, stuff like this, right? You can get nice meals, you can be taken out. Uh, all of this is available now. If you're worrying about your doctor, you can go to, there's something called the Sunshine Act in the ACA that made all of this information publicly available. So you can go to opendata.gov and type in your doctor's name and see how much money they have accepted from pharma. 
But the data on that is really depressing too. The more money doctors accept from pharma, the more they prescribe their pills. And the trim line is horrible because the doctors who take a lot of money prescribe a lot of pills, right? So this just keeps going and going and going. They're directly incentivized. They have no time. It makes their patients happy. You know, they also want to care for their patients. They hopefully have some sense of fallibility. They don't know that you don't need this. And so basically everything stacks up in favor of, I write a quick script, it goes away. The last thing is, we actually now know a lot more about adequate pain treatment. And the data that's coming out about opioids, we, we should not start to believe, based on my conversation, that opioids are bad drugs. They're super important. For traumatic, surgical, acute, really severe pain, opioids are magic. I needed them, right? But for a ton of the uses, they're not good drugs. And we just thought they were because they're so strong, right? They're so powerful. We're like, it's the cannon in our toolbox, and we need a tool. Use the cannon, right? And the more data we get, they're not that good. And so there are a lot of uses. There, there are a lot of pains where the best thing for you as a patient would be to exercise, go to yoga, go to therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, where you actually do talk therapy with somebody, has a demonstrable effect on your pain levels. And this is not like um, kooky. This is not new age, warm and fuzzy stuff. This is data driven because you cognitively modulate your pain with your brain, right? So you can teach your brain pathways that reduce your pain in a very real sense. All this stuff is evidence-based and it's expensive. So what does insurance cover? Pills. What does insurance very often not cover and not cover all that well? Physical therapy, your yoga classes, your professional massages, right? Your gym membership. That's the sort of structural stuff that absolutely has to change. So you might have been wanting something a little bit easier. I'd be like, if you fix X, it would be better. Uh, we have to fix all of it because the incentive structure pushes every doctor to write a quick script. And we need an incentive structure that tells them, sit down with your patients. If it takes 20 minutes, have a lifestyle conversation, find out if opioids are actually indicated, talk in a counseling treatment way about it. And that's really hard to do right now. Do we have time for one more taste? Yeah, absolutely. All right, yes ma'am. Yeah, yeah, you can yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> um, Throughout your research, have you encountered any conversations about incorporating these conversations into education of healthcare providers? Yes, such a good question. Education of healthcare providers. So a really important question is, how much do healthcare providers get educated on pain? You want to? Yeah, so you already know some of the answers. Um, so, Johns Hopkins, in fact, some of my colleagues did a study in 2011, 2012, trying to figure this out. And the average number of hours spent in the American medical system on pain is about seven. And then uh, Judy Foreman is this really sharp journalist for kind of comic juxtaposition, compared that to Canadian trained veterinarians. So, if you train to be a vet in Canada, you get about 81 hours of pain education. And um, many, many of the schools in the U.S. don't get any pain education, get zero hours, because it's not a required part of the medical school curriculum. So absolutely, I think it's one of the most important things. And thinking of, about how I ended, that this is not the only thing that's going to be necessary for the opioid crisis, addiction medicine faces something really similar. So two things that absolutely have to happen for education is pain management, education, that has components about a lot of the stuff that we talked about, the, the kind of mixed data, what we have and haven't known, patient contacts. So I get invited to speak to medical students, not only as a faculty member, but sometimes as a patient rep. Um, and that sort of thing I think is really important, but we also need it for addiction medicine. So I mean, that feels like low-hanging fruit too, right? Like AMA, government regulators, like let's get on this. Let's not let our doctors graduate with an MD not knowing anything about pain or addiction given the opioid crisis. Can I get another round of applause for